So good evening to everybody. Am I audible, sir? Good evening to everybody. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So I'll be muting everybody. Whenever you have doubt, you can raise your hands. Otherwise, in, or in the end of the meeting, we'll have the meeting. So we'll have that question as a session. So today evening, I'm going to talk about cervical disc prolapse, uh, acute cervical radiculopathy, how the patient is pressure, and how we are going to manage these patients. So uh, today I'm going to talk regarding cervical disc prolapse. As I said on the day, uh, disc prolapse, disc degeneration, spondylotic changes are more common in cervical spine and lumbar spine because the range of movement is more in cervical spine and lumbar spine compared to thoracic spine. So since there is more range of movement, there is more wear and tear in cervical and lumbar spine. So cervical disc prolapse and cervical uh, spondylosis are one of the most common presentations we see in our OPD practice. As I said earlier, so this is the vertebral body, this is the nucleus pulposus, this is the annulus. There is some degenerative changes occurring in the annulus. So there is a tear in the annulus, the nucleus is in the middle. Whenever there is an abnormal axial force, what happens? This nucleus finds its way out and compresses the uh, nerve roots. So this is what I told that day. Is it the only pathology happening in cervical spine? No, there are some other pathology happening in cervical spine in addition to what we see in lumbar spine. As you see here, whenever there is a disc prolapse or disc degeneration, what happens? The disc space collapses. As the disc space collapses, there is abnormal pressure over the annulus and the longitudinal ligaments. What happens? Whenever there is abnormal pressure over the attachment of the annulus and the longitudinal ligament, there is outgrowth of the osteophytes. This is we call it as cervical osteophytes. These are facetal osteophytes. In addition to the disc prolapse, these osteophytes can also cause root compression. You can see here, this is the axial section of the cervical spine. So in addition to the soft disc which is coming out and compressing the nerve root, there will be a hypertrophic oncovertebral joint. There can be hypertrophic facet joint. All these things can lead to cervical radiculopathy or cervical root compression. So it is not only a, a soft disc which is causing the root compression, it is other, other osteophytes from oncovertebral joint and from the facet joint can also cause a compression of the cervical root. So coming to the history and presentation, there, are, there can be three kinds of presentation in cervical pain or cervical radiculopathy. One is acute cervical radiculopathy, wherein there is a soft disc herniation occurring in younger age group individuals. In these individuals, there will not be any bony changes. There will not be any spondylotic changes. Patient will have acute neck pain associated with radicular pain. It is called as acute cervical radiculopathy. Patient will not have any previous history of chronic neck pain. Patient will present with acute neck pain with sharp shooting radiating pain. It occurs mainly in the younger individuals. It's coming to the subacute radiculopathy. Here is middle or older age people. There will be some degenerative changes already there in the cervical spine. So the patient will be having some sort of uh, axial neck pain because of cervical spondylosis. In addition to that, there will be some uh, disc herniation leading on to uh, acute radicular pain. So the patient is having chronic neck pain presented with acute exacerbation of pain with radiating pain. We call it as subacute radiculopathy. Coming to chronic radiculopathy, if the subacute radiculopathy patients went untreated, they may become chronic radiculopathy. So acute cervical radiculopathy occurs mainly in uh, younger individuals, 
while subacute radiculopathy and chronic radiculopathy occur mainly in uh, older middle age and older individuals we should all whenever a patient presents with acute radicular pain we should always ask for any previous history of axial neck pain or not this will come to come to this will make uh, help in diagnosis whether it is an acute problem or a subacute problem so usually the the, the, the patient can present with uh, three or four symptoms first is first one is radicular pain or arm pain so the patient will we we, we have to ask the patient to show where the pain starts and how it is going usually the patient will start uh, showing from the base of the neck running up to the arm or sometimes up to the forearm on the fingers so this is very important because there are there are many kinds of presentations patient with fibromyalgic pain will also present like this they will come with i am having neck pain and arm pain if you ask them to show where the pain is they usually show neck region and the scapular region they will not come down to the arm and the forearm region in case of radicular pain the typically the patient will show the pain is running from the shoulder come into the arm and the forearm usually we call these patients as having restless arm they will try to find a position of convenience they will try to hold the arm they will try to uh, hold the arm above the head they will try to bring the arm below the uh, back so somehow they want to find a position of comfort they will have some pain relief for a few seconds again they will have pain so this is called as restless arm we can call it as a restless arm also second thing is axial neck pain as i said earlier uh, axial neck pain is usually present in case of pre existing cervical spondylosis and usually in middle aged old age uh, patients next comes a motor weakness so what kind of motor weakness usually the patient presents so usually the most common nerve root involved in cervical radiculopathy are either c5 root shoulder abduction c6 root elbow flexion c7 root elbow extension these are the three most common routes involved c5 shoulder abduction shoulder flexion by c6 c7 is triceps uh, uh, elbow extension usually the motor the patient will not tell the motor motor weakness except in c5 radiculopathy some some people with c5 radiculopathy will come with uh, c5 root weakness wherein the patient will be able to abduct the shoulder they will say that i am not able to do the overhead activities usually c6 root involvement and c7 root involvement we have to examine and find out patient will not tell the weakness only c5 weakness patient will tell so c5 weakness patients will tell that they are not able to do overhead activities so these are the most common presentations axial neck pain shooting radiating arm and forearm pain third is motor weakness So these are the dermatomal pattern. As I said earlier, the C5 dermatome usually comes in the shoulder level, and um, the, the radial side of the forearm and the hand is C6, middle finger is C7, and the ulnar aspect is C8. Usually in a lumbar spine, the radicular pain corresponds to the sensory dermatome. In lumbar spine, repeat in lumbar spine. that uh, radiating pain corresponds to the sensory dermatome but in cervical radiculopathy the radicular pain corresponds to the myotome for example if the patient is having c5 radiculopathy patient will have pain over the deltoid muscle region if the patient is having c7 radiculopathy patient will have pain over the triceps region so the radicular pain in uh, in cervical spine does not follow sensory dermatome rather it follows myotomal region uh, in typical cervical radiculopathy patient when you receive in the opd most of the time they will come with either hand over the head okay so as i said earlier in, uh, in lumbar spine there is a sciatic nerve in a root stretch test so whenever the patient is letting the a show arm or show arm and forearm below in that dropping down the nerve root gets stretched the pain will be intolerable so what they will do they will abduct the arm and they will keep the hand over the head okay this we call it as shoulder abduction sign also so by keeping keeping like this they shorten they relax the nerve root and patient will have some sort of pain relief so this is called as 
shoulder abduction sign usually patients comes with uh, more many patients come like this keeping the arm abducted it will give some sort of pain relief second thing is holding the elbow or holding the arm letting the arm and forearm down increases the pain by stretching the nerve root either by abducting the arm or by holding the arm patient finds some sort of pain relief so you should try to notice these kind of signs when the patient arrives in your opd coming to some specific tests what are the as we have a slr test in lumbar spine so we can uh, similar way we can we have some specific tests for cervical nerve root signs so first one is purling sign what is purling sign so we have to ask the patient to sit down in a chair or a stool we have to make hyper extension of the cervical spine and rotate the cervical spine to the side of symptom so the patient is having right side radiculopathy hyper extend the neck and rotate the neck to the right side okay hyper extension and rotation to the same side of pain what happens when you are hyper extending and rotating the neural foramen the size of the neural foramen narrows so it pinches the nerve so normally if the neural foramen is normal the nerve root will not be pinched if there is any osteophyte or if there is any disc prolapse compressing the nerve root this maneuver of hyper extension and rotation to the same side will pinch the nerve root patient will have very shooting type of pain this is called as purling test this is equivalent to straight leg raising test in lumbar spine next is axial cervical compression test so when the you ask the patient to sit in a stool or a couch you put pressure you put your palm over the head of the patient and give axial compression downwards what happens here also the neural foramen gets uh, narrowed down pinching the nerve root patient will have reproduction of the cervical radicular pain this is called as axial cervical compression test this is not very specific but in most of the patients it is positive opposite to it cervical distraction test so if the patient is having pain in axial compression test when you are distracting try to hold the chin of the patient and lift the patient up what happens the neural foramen opens up this relieves the pain so this is uh, opposite of axial compression test fourth is shoulder abduction sign as i said earlier when you are abducting the shoulder and keeping the uh, palm over the head the nerve roots get relaxed so when you are putting the arm down the nerve root gets stretched so the patient when you are abducting the shoulder and putting the palm over the head patient will have pain relief so this is called as shoulder abduction sign i usually do spurling sign and shoulder abduction sign when the spurling sign is positive the patient is having pain and the shoulder abduction sign relieves the pain in the, in the 95% of the time patient should be diagnosed to have a cervical radicular pain most probably due to cervical disc prolapse so these signs are very very important and it gives a clue to the diagnosis then coming to the specific test for specific nerve roots one um, uh, specific uh, point in cervical uh, spine is so there are seven cervical vertebras but there are eight cervical nerve root why is it so because so you can see here this is the c1 vertebral body above the c1 vertebral body c1 nerve root arises okay so we have one cervical root extra so above the cervical vertebral body c1 c2 and below the c1 vertebral body we have c8 so we have eight uh, cervical nerve roots so we have eight cervical nerve roots for seven cervical vertebra this knowledge is very important to diagnose which nerve root is getting uh, compressed so coming to the lumbar spine disc prolapse comparing the lumbar spine disc prolapse and cervical spine disc prolapse so in lumbar spine disc prolapse what happens so this is the vertebral body this is the intervertebral disc this is the dura and these are the nerve root so whenever there is a paracentral disc prolapse that traversing nerve root is affected whenever there is an far lateral disc prolapse the exiting nerve root is affected in lumbar spine is it the same in cervical spine no here either it is paracentral either it is central paracentral or far lateral 
any position of disc prolapse will affect only the one root because here the nerve root originates in the caudally uh, cranially and it travels down while in cervical spine they arise at the same level and they have an horizontal course here you can see they travel down vertic longitudinally and then travel horizontally here the nerve roots are arranged horizontally there is a difference between lumbar spine and cervical spine cervical spine any position of disc only the nerve root which is traveling through the foramen is affected there is no difference between far lateral and paracentral disc prolapse so in case of c5 c6 disc prolapse c6 nerve root is affected in case of c6 c7 disc prolapse c7 nerve root is affected so c5 c6 below level root c6 root is affected c6 c7 c7 nerve root is affected you should remember this so this basic knowledge is very important diagnosing cervical disc prolapse so uh, the most important nerve roots which are affected in cervical disc prolapse are c5 c6 and c7 nerve root we will see those roots separately coming to c5 nerve root so c5 nerve root will be affected in c4 c5 disc prolapse in c4 c5 disc prolapse c5 nerve root is affected c5 nerve root has got motor sensory and reflex component motor component so motor component is deltoid so deltoid shoulder abduction so c5 the motor component is shoulder abduction one second the reflex component is biceps reflex third the sensory component is over the regiment batch area the same axillary nerve root axillary nerve uh, is predominantly by c5 nerve root the um, the outer aspect of the shoulder corresponds to the c5 sensory motor, sensory uh, uh, area so c5 motor is deltoid reflex is biceps sensory region is outer aspect of the shoulder c6 the motor is use there are two motor one is biceps elbow flexion by c6 second is wrist extension among this shoulder uh, the elbow flexion and wrist extension wrist extension is more specific for c6 nerve root uh, reflex is by supinator reflex the sensory component is as i said earlier radial part of the forearm and thumb and the index finger this is the um, motor neurological examination for c6 nerve root to, to, the main thing is we should check for wrist extension in c, for c6 because elbow flexion is supplied equally by c5 and c6 elbow flexion is weak in both in case of c5 uh, uh, radiculopathy and c6 radiculopathy coming to c7 nerve root involvement c6 c7 disc prolapse will compress c7 nerve root c7 nerve root the main motor component is triceps check for elbow extension it is like gastrocnemius so it is this is this elbow extension is aided by a gravity so usually patient will not complain of any motor weakness you should test passively and usually uh, the triceps weakness will not cause much functional disability so tricep should be examined for c7 the other nerve root is other uh, muscle we have to take is uh, wrist flexion is the other motor function supplied by c7 nerve root reflex is triceps reflex sensory is middle finger is the uh, sensory region for c7 nerve root coming to c8 nerve root c8 nerve root is compressed by c7 uh, uh, whenever there is c7 t1 disc prolapse it is very rare because at c7 at the cervical thoracic junction the range of movement is very less so the disc degeneration and, and resultant uh, disc prolapse is very rare in c7 t1 disc prolapse usually c7 t1 disc prolapse mimics ulnar nerve uh, um, ulnar entrapment syndrome or ulnar neuropathy because the distribution is similar to the top ulnar nerve here we have to check check um, check for finger abduction and finger adduction motor power sensation is along the ulnar aspect of the forearm and the finger reflex there is no reflex so usually i examine 
four motor four muscles first is shoulder abduction for c5 wrist extension for c6 elbow extension for c7 and finger abduction adduction for c8 these are the four quick muscle examination for the cervical radiculopathy so there are upper cervical radiculopathy also c1 root c2 root c3 c4 root can can also get compressed but it's very very rare usually as i said earlier as in lumbar spine the upper lumbar radiculopathy usually present with low back ache similarly upper cervical radiculopathy also they will present with uh, um, non specific complaints of neck pain scapular region pain or headache when other all other causes are ruled out you can take an mri to rule out upper cervical radiculopathy but one clinching diagnosis says in even in this case of upper cervical radiculopathy the spurling sign and davidson sign will be positive so if it is positive and the patient is having only predominantly neck pain and a, a scapular region pain you think about upper cervical radiculopathy when you are exam when the patient is having neck pain radicular pain you are checking for reflexes usually in radicular pain the reflexes should be absent so when there is right side triceps reflex is there left side is absent you think about seasonal radiculopathy but in some condition if there is abnormal exaggerated reflexes what should you should think about myelopathy so if the patient is having neck pain radicular pain with exaggerated reflexes we should think that the patient is having some sort of myelopathy so you can see here there is two kinds of presentation so on my uh, right side this is a cervical disc this is a cervical cord this is the root getting out of the canal here there is an paracentral or foraminal disc prolapse compressing the root alone the cord is not at all involved while here there is a central disc prolapse compressing the cord so there is a cord edema also here so this sort of central disc prolapse can lead to myelopathy in case of myelopathy usually the radicular symptoms will not be there but neck pain can be there so whenever you are examining a patient of neck pain and the patient is having some exaggerated reflexes you should think about myelopathy you should not forget it so you have examined uh, all this uh, patient is presenting with axial neck pain radicular pain is there you are examining the patient patient is having um, all positive findings of for example c7 or c6 radiculopathy what you should do so if the patient is not having any significant neurological deficit there is some sort of muscle power for say for example 3 by 5 or 4 by 5 and um, the patient is having severe pain there is no need for any further investigation at this point so you know the most common cause of cervical radiculopathy is cervical disc prolapse to treat conservatively give analgesics give oral steroids advise them to take rest so wait for some time if the patient is improving there is no need for any imaging investigations x ray or mri the patient is having persistent pain even after one or two weeks of conservative management then you can go for investigations so usually the first line of investigation is x ray x ray will not show any disc prolapse but if there is any cervical degeneration or cervical spondylotic changes you can pick it up so to my left is a normal x ray you can see in an any well taken x ray you should at least c1 to c7 should be visible okay so what we in our pro institution the protocol is we take cervical spine lateral view in standing position giving some weight in the patient's uh, arm so the patient has to carry some weight in their hand so that the shoulder is pulled down whenever the shoulder is pulled down the visibility of c7 or up to c uh, t1 vertebral body is possible so lateral view standing with patient carrying weight is mandatory to get a clear cervical spine x ray why standing view uh, only in standing view we can assess what is the amount of cervical lordosis is there any instability or not when the patient is uh, we are when we ask the patient to lie down the cervical lordosis can be obliterated whether the patient is having cervical lordosis or not is important in surgical decision making also so this is a normal cervical spine you can see cervical vertebra disc spaces and uh, spinous process all those things so if if the patient is having cervical spondylosis what you should note one first thing to be noted is cervical disc uh, narrowing you can see here here the cervical disc spaces are well maintained 
vertebral bodies are well maintained here you can see the disc space is collapsed this is the first sign of disc degeneration so when the disc degeneration occurs what happens there is abnormal pull over the anterior longitudinal ligament and annulus there is osteophyte growth you can see the osteophyte growth here you can see osteophyte here also you can see here when you take a closer closer look here the vertebral body is square and the ends are smooth here you see there are small bony outgrowths so this is very very important because when the patient is having uh, radicular pain and when you notice these kind of posterior osteophytes you should we, we can call it as hard disc it is not a soft disc so the, there is a disc collapse along with there is some osteophytes compressing the nerve root we can term it as hard disc so the mri will not give you any clue regarding these osteophytes so these osteophytes can be picked either by x ray or by so ct cervical spine so what else we can see in the x ray cervical spine ossified posterior longitudinal ligament is very very important so you see this x ray carefully this is c1 this is c2 c3 c4 c5 so this is the posterior vertebral body line can you see that so posterior vertebral margin okay so behind the posterior vertebral margin can you see an ossified mass or hyperintense mass here okay so this is where the posterior longitudinal ligament is there and it has got ossified and it is seen in the x ray as a hyperintense lesion so a yeah, ct scan of the same patient can you see that ossified posterior longitudinal ligament why i am insisting this is salem dharmapuri and krishnagiri region or endemic region of pleurosis and there is a strong association between pleurosis and ossified posterior longitudinal ligament and there are more number of patients suffering from ossified posterior longitudinal ligament in this part of the state compared to any other part of the state so salem dharmapuri na krishnagiri patients and orthopedic surgeons who are going to practice there you should be well aware of this condition so this is called as ossified posterior longitudinal it is we cannot make a strong diagnosis but it gives us a clue that there is a uh, there is an ossified mass which could compress the cervical spine so for the first year postgraduate students how to find for the number number numbering of the cervical spine so usually the longer spine is the bigger spinous process can you see here this one spared leg spinous process this corresponds to c2 vertebral body so this is c2 okay and the largest vertebral body the, the the longest vertebral body is also c2 so we count from c2 down so this identifying this longer spinous process is very important in surgery or surgery also in exposing when you are palpating the spinous process we can localize the level of the uh, cervical spine and in cm picture also we have to look for the c2 uh, uh, long spinous process to sum up x ray if the patient is having persistent symptoms even after 2 weeks x ray will give you the idea regarding whether the patient is having cervical spondylosis whether there is posterior osteophytes or not cervical lordosis is there or not and if possible we can look for ossified posterior longitudinal ligament always take x ray in standing view so if there are uh, as in lumbar spine there are indications for mri in cervical spine also if the patient is having persistent severe neck pain and radicular pain even beyond to, for example for 3 weeks or 4 weeks of conservative management we can go for mri if the patient is uh, having constitutional symptoms like fever and chills or there is a history of malignancy or suspecting a uh, secondary deposit you go for mri immediately if the patient is having neurological deficit which is affecting his day to day activities for example c7 root weakness uh, triceps weakness for if patient is having 3 by 5 power he is not able to extend the uh, elbow against resistance this is not going to affect him in any function so usually patient present with two days of pain you find c7 nerve root weakness there is no need to rush for mri scan but if the patient is having c5 weakness patient is not able to uptake the shoulder then you have to rush for mri scan because c5 weakness c5 row c5 muscle is very very important for daily activities while c7 triceps is an uh, gravity assisted muscle and it is not going to affect in a major way so in those kind of uh, mild c7 weakness or c6 weakness 
we can wait for one or two weeks to recover. If the patient is having persistent pain and persistent neurological deficit, we can go for MRI of the cervical spine. But added to that, if the patient is having a gait disturbance also along with pain, you think regarding cervical myelopathy. Or in case of examination, when your patient is having exaggerated reflexes, you are thinking about cervical myelopathy. If you are thinking cervical myelopathy, don't wait for conservative management. You straight away go for MRI scan. I repeat, if the patient is having exaggerated reflexes and features of cervical myelopathy, and if the patient is having gait disturbance, you straight away go for MRI. It is an indication for MRI. There is no role for conservative management in these kind of patients. So MRI, what we are going to do? So as I said earlier, in MRI scan, the sagittal view is of more important in cervical spine because in axial cuts of cervical spine is more crowded. It is not like lumbar spine where you clearly see a disc. In cervical spine, uh, the, 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 there is very small space cord occupies the space, you don't see the nerve clearly. Identifying disc prolapse is very is little bit difficult. If the disc prolapse is very small, if it is a huge disc prolapse, you can diagnose in axial cuts. So concentrate more on the sagittal cuts. So as I said on that day, so this is the sagittal cuts of cervical spine. So the, you can see here, sagittal, they were marked as right to left. So this is the right sagittal. You can see the facet joints here. So this is the foramen, foramen, okay. For going further uh, towards the midline, further towards the midline, this is the foramen. You see the C2 vertebral body, C3 vertebral body, intervertebral disc here. This is the cervical cord and roots are coming out. So this is the center part. You can see this is the central cut. From central cut, we move towards the left side, okay. Towards the left side foramen. So this is the center to my left side. It is right side foramen and the right side uh, no roots. Left side, left side foramen and the uh, left side no roots. So understanding this, that the, usually the MRI is taken from right side to left side. It's very important in diagnosing the disc prolapse. Sagittal cuts are very important compared to axial cuts. So this is the axial cut. You see here, so this is the vertebral body at the level of the disc. Lamina, spinous process lamina and the facet joint so this is the neural foramen this is the neural foramen you see here so this is the cord this is the csf surrounding it so you can see the continuation of the csf to the foramen because usually the root sleeves also there will be some sort of csf you can see a uh, bright intensity here on contrary in case of right side what happens there is an uh, hypo intense uh, zone scene. So, this is the disc prolapse. So, an axial cut you see towards your left side, this side is right side. This is left side. Whenever you are seeing disc prolapse here, it corresponds to right side disc prolapse. Whenever you see a disc prolapse here, it corresponds to left side disc prolapse. You should not get confused. So, this is what how we see the uh, disc prolapse in axial cut. So, as in lumbar spine, the position of disc prolapse can also can vary in cervical spine also. So, coming to this picture, can you see here? So, there is a central disc prolapse. So, you can see the root here is free. You can see the root here is literally uh, relatively free. And central disc prolapse is compressing the cervical cord. So, central disc prolapse does not compress roots usually compresses the cord it can lead to cervical myelopathy so here you can see so this is a paracentral disc prolapse you can see here paracentral disc prolapse compressing the root here here it is more lat little bit lateral to the paracentral it is a foraminal disc prolapse so this is foraminal disc prolapse little medial to there is a paracentral disc prolapse it is a central disc prolapse Paracentral and foramenal disc prolapse compresses the nerve root, while central disc prolapse compresses the cord. Cord compression is more dangerous compared to root compression. So only I am telling that if the patient is having myelopathic features or gait disturbance, you should go for MRI immediately. While root compression we can treat conservatively, so we can wait and watch. 
So coming here to the uh, sagittal cuts. So as I said, sagittal cuts, they tell more clear about the disc collapse than the axial cuts. So here it is the previous picture of central disc collapse. You can see here central disc collapse. I want to notice, so there is an uniform intensity of the spinal cord. Can you see that? Spinal cord is dark in color, surrounded by the whitish CSF, okay? As you come to the level of the compression, can you see a little bit of whitening here? Okay, this could represent cord edema or myelomalacia. So in response to the cord compression by the disc collapse, there is some edema occurring. If there is some healing, then it will, uh, then also there will be some signal intensity changes. We call it as myelomalacia. So whenever a patient brings the MRI, you are seeing a significant compression and there is some whitish signal intensity changes in the cord. You think that the patient is having myelopathy with myelomalacic changes. You look for UMN signs or myelopathic signs. Here also you can see clear. So this is a vertebral body, disc prolapse. This is a spinal cord. Here there is, this is C2, C3, C4, C5. C4, C5, there is mild disc prolapse. But there is a significant cord edema or myelopathy. So these kind of uh, earlier features we can pick up it in MRI. So you should specifically look for whether the only root is involved or whether the cord is involved. If the cord is compressed, whether there is any uh, cord edema is there or not. So all these things you should look for in MRI. So, so here there are two comparisons. So this is the MRI. C2 vertebral body, C3, C4, C5. C4, C5, there is a disc prolapse. C5, C6, there is disc prolapse. There is two disc prolapses. C4, C5 is more prominent than C5, C6 level. Okay. So intervening. So what is intervening? There is the cord is not compressed. So see this picture. So two, three, four, five, six, seven. Six, seven. At the level of the disc, there is compression. But you can see a compression at the level of the vertebral body also. Usually in lumbar spine, there can be a disc prolapse which can migrate up or which can migrate down. But in case of cervical spine, this kind of migration is very, 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 very rare. Rarely we see a disc prolapse which is migrates proximally or distally. This kind of migration is only seen in the lumbar spine. This we will not see in cervical spine. If at all you are seeing a um, disc which is going up and down, this should be ossified posterior longitudinal ligament. Okay? This is a vertebral body. This is the disc. Can you see a, a dark blackish line running from up and down? Okay? This line is posterior longitudinal ligament. This posterior longitudinal ligament runs from the cervical spine to the lumbar spine. Okay. Anterior to the posterior longitudinal ligament is the spinal cord. So, due to many pathologies, due to some pathologies, this longitudinal ligament can get ossified. This ossified longitudinal ligament can compress the cord. It can produce mostly myelopathy, rarely radiculopathy also. So, when you are seeing MRI like this, definitely you should suspect ossified posterior longitudinal ligament. Hope I am clear. So to summarize the MRI, to summarize the MRI, MRI is needed only when there is a significant neurological deficit or if the pain is persisting even after significant conservative management or if there is any cervical myelopathic features like gait disturbance or exaggerated reflexes, you should get an MRI. MRI sagittal view is the one which gives you a clear idea regarding cervical disc prolapse. Axial view, if there is a central disc prolapse, you should see for cord compression, cord edema and myelomalacic changes. If the compression is only at the level of disc, it's okay. If, the, if you are seeing compression of the cord above or below, if you should think regarding ossified posterior longitudinal ligament. So I, I think I'm clear. We have uh, finished the history and presentation part, clinical examination part. 
X-ray, MRI. So what next? There are many differential diagnoses for neck pain with shoulder pain. Okay. The most common miss this thing is shoulder pathology. If the patient is having acute supraspinous tendinitis or periarthritis shoulder, they will definitely present with neck pain and typical radicular symptom like pain. So how will you differentiate? So as I said earlier, when the patient is abducting the shoulder and keeping the arm over the head, the pain gets relieved. While in case of periarthritis shoulder or supraspinous tendinitis, the movement of shoulder will be painful. So even in supraspinous tendinitis, hyperabduction can relieve the pain, but movement of the shoulder, that painful arc, will be there in supraspinatus, while in periarthritis shoulder, the, even the initial few rings of movement will be very painful. While in case of clear cut cervical radiculopathy, shoulder will movements will be free of pain. So shoulder examination is must in case of any patient with neck pain. In lumbar spine, we should always examine hip examination and SA joint examination. In cervical spine, we should always examine shoulder. Second is, if there is a sort of rotator cuff tear or supraspinatus tear, the shoulder abduction will be weak. So patient will have some neck pain, some shoulder region pain, abduction is weak. You should not conclude that patient is having C5 radiculopathy. So you should examine other muscle also. For C5, elbow flexion will also be weak. So if you are if you're finding that shoulder abduction is weak, you test for uh, elbow flexion. If elbow flexion is also weak, you think regarding C5 radiculopathy. If elbow flexion is normal, then you should think uh, in terms of rotator cuff tear. So these are the ways to differentiate between shoulder pathology and, and C5 radiculopathy. Other differential diagnosis, acute brachial plexus neuritis or brachial plexitis. Usually brachial plexitis is a diagnosis of exclusion. Here, usually the patient might be diabetic, middle age, old age patient, presenting with severe pain in the neck and the shoulder or arm region. When the patient present to us, patient will have significant wasting of the shoulder muscles also. Okay, but nerve root tension signs will not be there. Nerve root spiraling sign, Davidson sign will not be there. Okay, Davidson sign will not relieve the uh, shoulder abduction will not relieve the pain. Spurling sign will not, spurling test will not increase the pain. So that is one, one way of differentiating acute brachial plexitis. In this case of uh, patients having severe radicular pain, you take an MRI cervical spine. MRI cervical spine is absolutely normal. But patients having severe pain with wasting and wasting of the muscles and weakness. You talk with a radiologist, ask them to see the brachial plexus. Usually they will screen brachial plexus, few cuts. They will screen the brachial plexus also. If there is any edema in the brachial plexus, then it is a case of acute brachial plexitis. Usually I refer the patient to the neurologist. They will get a nerve conduction study done to confirm it and they start on high dose of steroids. So this is a differential diagnosis of cervical radiculopathy. Second is thoracic outlet syndrome. So thoracic outlet syndrome can also have an scapular neck pain with radiating pain. So usually, just by doing spurling sign and uh, Davidson sign, that is hyperabduction sign, we can uh, rule out thoracic outlet syndrome. In, in thoracic outlet obstruction, when you extend the neck and rotate the neck to the opposite side, the thoracic, thoracic outlet get, gets stenosed and there is reproduction of symptoms. While in case of cervical radiculopathy, we have to hyperextend and rotate the neck to the same side. So in thoracic outlet syndrome, we have to rotate the neck to the opposite side. There will be reproduction of tingling numbness in the forearm. In case of cervical radiculopathy, we have to rotate the, to the same side to stenose the cervical root foramen. So that is one. Second, hyperabducting. 
usually when you are hyperabducting the arm thoracic outlet obstruction syndrome symptoms get worsened while in case of cervical radiculopathy hyperabduction of the arm the cervical radiculopathy symptoms will go down so this is one of the main important differentiating feature hope i am clear so these are the three main differential diagnoses shoulder pathologies thoracic outlet obstruction syndrome brachial plexitis fourth common is fourth is um, anginal pain acute myocardial infarction patient might have chest pain and left side arm pain also been there many cervical radiculopathy patient they end up with cardiologist seeking that they are having chest pain and scapular region pain with arm pain if there is some changes in the ecg they will start on thrombolytic therapy and all those things I have seen two such patients where they were diagnosed to have cervical radical uh, diagnosed to have acute angina. There were some ECG changes, treated with uh, thrombolysis and other anti-angina measures. No pain relief. We evaluated the patient. Spiraling sign was positive. MRI showed clear-cut disc collapse. We gave steroids. Patient responded. So this is also a differential diagnosis. So other other minor differential diagnoses are carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, ulnar entrapment syndrome are the other differential diagnosis. So we have ruled out other differential diagnosis. The patient is having cervical radiculopathy, MRI is showing a disc collapse at C6, C7 level or C5, C6 level. So what we are going to do? So first thing is, I will confess, whenever I get a cervical disc collapse patient, I will be very, very happy because the results of conservative management is excellent. Even if one the five out of hundred patient is not responding to conservative management, the results of surgical management is also very very good. Usually, the cervical disc collapse patient, if you treat them correctly, they will respond very well to the treatment. Patient will be very happy, and doctor will also be happy. So these are one of the uh, one unlike lumbar disc collapse. Usually, lumbar disc collapse, even when the patient is relieved of pain, even after surgery, patient will have some sort of neck back pain. Occasional uh, aggravating of pain on bending down and all those things. While no such things will happen in cervical disc collapse, they are um, when they respond, they respond very well. If they are not responding, and if they do the surgery, the surgical results are far far better compared to lumbar disc collapse surgery. So the uh, in my in my experience that the results of conservative management, approximately 90% of the patients they will respond very well to the conservative management. Only 10% of the patients will go in for surgery. So, what are the conservative management? So, usually rest, medication, traction, exit in physical therapy, cervical epidural steroids, or selective nerve block. So, usually uh, in the clinical examination, we said that cervical axial compression test aggravates the symptom. When we lift the patient, that is cervical distraction test, the neuroframula widens up and the patient will have a relief of symptoms. So, theoretically speaking, cervical traction should reduce the symptoms. But I have seen in my experience, many patients, they get aggravated symptoms when we give cervical traction. Why? So, usually what the physiotherapists do, they will apply traction in supine position. Okay? some they will give some shoulder support also what happens all these maneuvers will uh, bring the head to the extension so whenever there is an extension there will be neural foramen narrowing patient will have aggravation of the symptoms if at all you are advising cervical dis, uh, uh, traction ask the physiotherapist to give traction in little bit of flexion okay Flexion, traction and flexion will leave symptoms while traction and extension will aggravate the symptoms. I practically don't advise cervical traction for acute dysplasia patient. I'd advise cervical traction only for axial neck pain with cervical spondylosis. Uh, I think that cervical traction is not of very much use in acute radicular symptoms. Okay. Second thing, there are many people who advise cervical collar. When you, when you see the cervical collar, the anterior part of the cervical collar will be broader while the posterior part will be short. So whenever you are applying a cervical, what happens? Neck goes in for extension. O automatically, what happens? The pain will increase. So extension uh, so make the neural foramen narrow 
pain will be more. Flexion, the neural foramen will widen, pain will be less. So, when we apply cervical collar, the neck will go in for extension, pain will be more. When we apply cervical traction extension, the neural foramen narrowing can occur, causing of nerve root pain. So, if at all you are giving cervical uh, soft collar, you ask them to wear the reverse. So, the narrow part will come anteriorly, the broader part will go posteriorly. So, what is advantage of this? So, what is advantage of this? The advantage is uh, the, this applying the cervical collar in reverse position will make the neck in, uh, will bring the neck to flexion. Flexion will reduce the symptoms. So, this is the ideology of using cervical collar in reverse position. So, coming to how I treat the patients. So, I use, I always ask the patient to, for complete rest. So, I ask the patients to take complete bed rest with larger pillow or a pillow sufficient enough to keep the neck in flexion. So, the, the myth is whenever patients having neck pain, they should sleep without pillow. Without pillow, if they sleep, the neck pain might aggravate or the radicular pain might aggravate. So, always ask the patient to use pillow sufficient enough to prevent extension of the neck. One, I will give strong NSAIDs, anti-inflammatory. Usually, I said oral steroids. Steroids will help reduce the inflammation. In lumbar spine, I give transforminal nerve root block or transforminal steroid. While same transforminal steroid or epidural steroid in cervical spine is technically demanding, and there are complications associated with it. So I don't try that. I give oral steroids. Usually I start deflosocort. Deflosocort is a steroid where the mineralocorticoid effect is very less. So all the side effects of uh, steroids is less compared to other methylprednisolone or uh, hydrocortisone. So this is oral form. I start with 24 milligrams for 3 days or 4 days. Gradually top, tap it over the 10 days period. I stop the steroids by 10 days. Maximum I give steroids for 10 days only. I give high dose of frigabalin and most of the acute cervical radicular pain patients they will not, they will, they definitely they will have uh, insomnia because of sleep, uh, because of pain. Severe pain, they will not be able to lie down uh, quietly in the bed. They will be turning this side, that side. At least to give them complete rest, I give some sedation like solpidem or alprazolone. Once they come for review, they are responding well to the treatment. I start them on gentle neck exercises. So this is the way I treat. If the patient is a diabetic patient, when you're giving a deflosor cord, the blood sugar may shoot up. So always ask the patient to consult their respective physician to increase their diabetic dosages. So cervical traction, IFT, and all those things, I never advise. Cervical collar, I never advise. So 90% of the patient, the patient will respond. If the patient is not responding, what to do? So usually I give minimum of four to five weeks of consultative management. The patient is not responding. Significant radicular pain affecting their day-to-day -day activities. If there is significant neurological deficit, not improving. Or if there is features of cervical myelopathy, I will advise them surgery. So what kind of surgery is important in lumbar spines, in cervical spine, this prolapse? Usually it's an anterior cervical spine surgery. So there are many differences between discectomy in cervical spine and discectomy in lumbar spine. In example, in lumbar spine, we do posterior approach, more common. While in uh, cervical spine, we do anterior approach. Why? Because in lumbar spine, we have cauda equina and nerve roots. We can treat the cauda equina and nerve roots like peripheral nerve. We can mobilize, we can retract, nothing will happen. They are pliable and are less prone for injury. While in case of cervical spine, we cannot retract the cervical cord. Okay, even cervical node, if you pull, it will give traction injury to the cervical cord. The cervical cord is more prone for injury. So, a retra retra retraction or using the nerve root retractor is not advisable in cervical spine. So, we are going for anterior. While in case of uh, lumbar spine, 
we can retract and you can find the nerve root underneath the uh, dura. So that is the main difference between lumbar spine and cervical spine. Second, in lumbar spine, we are going posterior. The initial part of the disc which are taking out is very, very important because that is the one which is causing the nerve root compression. While in cervical spine, we are going anteriorly. The last part of the disc which you are taking is very important. The last part of the disc is the uh, main culprit. So we, we might have taken the whole of the cervical, the uh, anterior cervical disc, but we'd have left the last part. The patient will have persistent symptoms. The last part of the disc is the very important part. We should take it out. We should ensure that the root is free. So I usually prefer anterior cervical spine surgery. Usually for anterior cervical spine surgery, this is the position we recommend. So the patient in supine position. So, so this, can you see this? This is a, either we can keep one liter normal sign bottle or we can roll, roll a sheet or two and keep it under the shoulder blade. So why this we are keeping? By keeping the shoulder blade, the support, what happens? The shoulder will drop down. Okay, so you should keep this little below the shoulder. The shoulder will drop down and the cervical spine visualization will be better. One. Second, we should pull the shoulder and plaster it to the table so that up to C71 we can easily visualize. Third, position of the neck. Position of the neck should be in neutral position. Okay, there are many surgeons who do cervical spine surgery where they hyperextend the neck. I think by hyperextending, the disc will be easily approachable. That's completely wrong. When you hyperextend, what happens? The anterior part of the disc opens out, while the posterior part of the disc space it it collapses. It it is it um it closes down. So the anterior part of the disc opens out, while the posterior part of the disc uh, closes down. So the the main aim of this, uh, this thing is we have to keep the posterior part of the disc space also open so that it is easier to take the last part of the disc. Okay, these are the tips for positioning patient. So usually what is the approach we use? So we use anterior uh, Smith-Robinson approach. So you can see here the anatomy. This is the sternocleidomastoid. These are the strap muscles. In the center we have trachea. So usually we mark the level under the C-arm. We can go for the horizontal skin incision because when we use a vertical skin incision, the scar will be very, very ugly. We can use a horizontal skin incision. Expose the, cut the platysma. We will see the sternocleidomastoid. So what we have to do, this is a sternocleidomastoid and a carotid sheath. We retract it laterally while the strap muscles along with the trachea and the esophagus we should retract medially. What happens? The, uh, the disc space is exposed. Okay. I'm not detailing each and every step of uh, surgery. So once you expose, you place the retractors. So this is the vertebral body. This is the disc. So what happens? This is the uh, instrument we use. Pin distractor. So if it is C5, C6 disc collapse, we, we put a pin in C5, we put a pin in C6 vertebral body, we distract it. What happens while distracting, the disc space gets opened up, we uh, incise the annulus, we take, we curate the disc out, and then later comes the posterior longitudinal ligament. We have to excise the posterior longitudinal ligament so that any extruded disc material can be removed. Once you see the card, then that is the end of your decompression. Once the discectomy is done, there are various modalities to, oh, set, uh, to treat the empty disc space. So the whole of the disc you have to remove. There are various modalities. Either you can go for uh, iliac crest grafting along with plating. That is one option. Or you can just put a grafting without plating. Or we can put a cage without plating, or in, in advanced uh, situations, we can go for disc replacement. But that doesn't matter. Either you put graft, or you put graft with the plating, or you do disc replacement, or you put a cage. It doesn't matter. 
the main thing which matters is whether you have decompressed it completely or not. If you do a higher disc replacement surgery without removing the last bit of disc, the surgery is going to fail. So the method of reconstructing the disc space doesn't matter. The main thing is we have to decompress it completely. So there are other advanced surgeries like posterior uh, foraminotomy and taking the disc out. Usually the neurosurgeons, they do posterior foraminotomy and if it is an extruded disc, we can remove that. That is also an uh, option. Other as endoscopic techniques are also coming up in cervical disc prep surgery. All the, these are advanced techniques. But whatever the techniques advance, the main thing is we have to take that the last disc fragment out. What are the complications associated with the disc surgery? Usually while exposure, so while exposure, so you, are, you, are, you are dealing with the carotid sheath. So carotid artery and carotid vein are there. Tell the carotid vein. So jugular vein and the carotid artery are there. So while exposure, if you are not careful, we can injure the, but, uh, the major vessels, one thing. Second, medial we are having trachea and the esophagus. So esophagus, usually we will not see the esophagus. When we are not using the bipolar cautery judiciously, we might injure the esophagus. If the esophageal perforation is not diagnosed, on table and we leave it is usually catastrophic. These are the major complications associated with the anterior cervical spine injury. Injury to the major blood vessels or injury to the esophagus. Other complications are minor complications like recurrent laryngeal nerve injury. Usually on the right side, the course of the lacrimal laryngeal nerve is large, while left side, the course of the lacrimal laryngeal nerve is short. So there is a chance of traction injury of recurrent laryngeal nerve if you are going through the right side. Usually most of the patient will recover. The symptom is hoarseness of the voice. And since we are retracting the trachea and the esophagus towards one side, patient will have painful deglutition, painful swallowing, which will settle down in two to three days. So these are the complications associated with anterior cervical spine surgery. Usually the results of the cervical spine surgery are very good. Okay. So that comes to the end of the presentation. Hope I have covered pathophysiology of cervical disc. What are the uh, investigations, the modalities? What are the uh, physical findings? What are the differential diagnosis? What are the constructive management? Hope I have covered everything. So I will unmute everybody so you can start asking the questions. <laughs> Uh, uh, so everybody were asking, you can unmute yourself. Otherwise, the, the noise level is very high. Kevin, can you un unmute yourself? Kevin, you can unmute yourself when I ask the question. I'm not hearing you now. Yes, yes. Now can you hear me? Yes, yes, man. Yes, man. I'm, I'm hearing you. Oh, I wanted to ask one question. How long does it take from uh, to progress from myelopathy to myelomalacia? So it's a very uh, difficult question usually. Uh, the, the, there is no exact timeline giving from where uh, from the onset of myelopathy to myelomalacia. So usually the MRA findings. If there is some patient is having only card edema, some patient is having myelomalacic changes. We cannot prognosticate using those things. Some might say there is some signal intensity changes in the MRI. Even if you operate, patient will not improve. It's not so. The prognosis is based on the, the neurology at the time of presentation. The patient is presenting with uh, lesser symptoms, like a uh, patient is having only mild gait, uh, gait disturbance, patient is walking. But there is, uh, human signs are there. If you operate, the chance of improving is very high. Or if the patient is coming in a wheelchair, not able to walk with myelopathy, even if you operate, the chance of recovery is less. So the, import, the, the importance given to myelomalacic changes is only mainly theoretical. And the prognosis is based on the neurology of the presentation rather than myelomalacia or edema and the car. So when the patient comes to you on wheelchair, uh, what do you do? You tell him the prognosis and still operate? He definitely, definitely we have to tell the prognosis. We have to tell them that if the patient is having some hand function left, patient is able to eat by himself. 
patients with bladder bowel control are okay we are going to operate only to safeguard these functions the patient hand function will not worsen further patient bladder bowel will be retained making him walk again is 90% of them will not be there patient might improve but we should tell like that we cannot promise a improvement and operate those patients while the scenario is totally different cervical disc collapse cervical disc collapse with severe pain so if you do surgery properly the prognosis is very good and the patient will be very happy okay thank you thank you thank you hemant thank you for joining me vishnu thank you well yeah uh... Uh, wow. what is your long term follow up in with or without uh, disc face reconstruction techniques with or without disc face reconstruction usually uh, my professor dr rajshir used to say that uh, when you are operating on the lower cervical disc for example c7 yeah. t1 level disc okay, okay. the movement yeah. at c7 t1 disc collapse is uh, very less yeah so in those cases what we can do is we can operate uh, even without as a uh, grafting we can okay. just do a c71 discectomy and come out nothing will happen okay. while we are doing an upper level like c5 c6 c6 c7 when you are yes, operating yes. we have to place yes. a spacer because uh, fo focal kyphosis can occur at that level okay yeah. so i usually prefer just to put an iliac crest graft okay the reason is the fusion is faster one thing yeah. second even if there is an uh, yeah, disc the graft is some extrusion of the graft occurs over a yeah. period of time it reabsorbs and it unites okay uh. adding a plate adding a plate will will increase the union rate but it's actually not needed actually okay for stand alone cages stand alone cages the as per literature is also okay stand alone cages also giving the same amount of results but only problem with stand alone cages is when the cages is misfitting and the cage comes out it is very prominent and it irritates the esophagus and the patient will have some degeneration problems and you might have to reopen again but that kind of problem will not occur in uh, iliac crest graft even if it comes out it will reabsorb itself but having said that if you put appropriate cage the cage protrusion chances very very less okay thank you thank you sir any other questions from post graduates vishnu yes sir in any of your cases in your follow up of your mri have you seen there is any regression of the disc yes sir definitely sir definitely sir so usually they would have taken some mri some over a few months back six months back they got a disc they will again come with some other problem or some other thing we getting a repeat mri scan done i have i have seen the regression of disc even cervical cervical disc collapse also and lumbar disc collapse also and this regression of disc have been very well documented in the literature sir and is there any that, difference uh, and they say that the regression of disc is more faster and more commonly seen in extruded disc than in contained disc so when a disc come uh, metal comes out it is easy for the immune system to attack if it is a contained disc it is difficult for the immune system to attack sir is the anatomy of the nucleus pulposus yes the sir nucleus pulposus in the uh, in the disc space is it exactly in the center or just posterior to the central uh, as in lumbar spine or what is the level of the nucleus pulposus situated sir. in the cervical spine and the lumbar spine one of the causes of posterior protrusion of the disc in lumbar spine sir usually usually the nucleus pulposus is exactly in the center of the the oval shape this thing okay. so why the, the the center why the importance is that only when it is in the center it can receive the axial load and it can dissipate uh, radially cuz it comes to the annulus so that position of nucleus is very important um so you are asking why the cervical disc collapse is not migrating up and down compared to lumbar no, disc no, that that you told me it is very rare in cervical spine yes sir yes sir you told me in lumbar spine when there is a puncture or there is a tear in the superior part of the annulus fibros you will get a superior migration, a migration. yes sir if i yes, am sir. right yes sir uh, i thought i what i thought i i somewhere long ago i read in macnab that the nucleus pulposus is not exactly in the center slightly posterior to the midline which is one of the causes of posterior migration of the nucleus pulposus 
posteriorly rather than going anteriorly. Anteriorly, yes, yes, you, you are correct, sir. You are correct, sir. Is it the same in cervical spine? Is like that? Yes, de sir, definitely, sir. Definitely, sir. Sir, for example, cervical spine and lumbar spine, they are lordotic. Yeah. Lordotic. In those cases, what happens? The annulus is larger anteriorly, and the nucleus is a little bit pushed posteriorly. Okay. So the large annulus anteriorly is one of the reason for a lordotic uh, curvature of cervical spine and lumbar spine. Okay. So whenever the disc space collapses, what happens? The lordosis is lost, both in cervical spine and lumbar spine. Uh, I missed your talk about the advantages of doing an anterior approach to the cervical spine. I, I missed the talk. Sir, that anterior approach uh, is because uh, in lumbar spine, we are dealing with cauda epina nerve root. So we can retract and we can go under the cauda, the, the, the dura, and we can take the disc out. Retraction will not cause any um, urological problem deficit. But in case of cervical spine, if you go posteriorly, we cannot retract the cord or the root. It will cause traction injury to the cord. Okay. So in that case, um, anterior surgery is much safer compared to the posterior surgery. But now there are many neurosurgeons who are doing posterior foraminotomy and they are putting a, uh, they are not exposing the cord. Just going under the nerve root and taking the disc out, but it's technically demanding, sir. Thank you, thank you very much. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Any other questions from the students? So, there so are bilateral, other... yes, yeah, yeah, Motilal. So in bilateral uh, root compression, how to differentiate from thoracic outlet syndrome by doing Sperling's or Davidson test, sir? Yes, that's uh, that's an uh, excellent question. So, we can use my Davidson sign. So Davidson sign is updating the shoulder and patient will have relief of symptoms. Well, in case of thoracic outlet obstruction, abduction of shoulder will increase the symptoms in one way. In, in spiraling sign also, when, when you are ex hyperextending and rotating the same side, the symptom will be on the same side. Okay, okay, sir. So in case of uh, thoracic outlet obstruction, the symptom will be on the opposite side. Okay. That's one way of Usually, when you are when you are confused, when you are having some doubt, when you are ordering an MRI, you talk to the radiologist and ask them to screen the thoracic outlet region also. Oh. So anyway, they are going to take a cervical spine MRI. So you can ask them to get an uh, oh, uh, uh, thoracic outlet also. They will find whether there is any cervical rib or any abdominal uh, ossified uh, the, the ligament to which is causing the thoracic outlet obstruction. Okay. Vishnu. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No. Yeah, yeah, saying it well. Yeah, what are the post op indications for MRI? Post operative indications for MRI. Yes. yes. So usually, in my case, if the patient is having persistent symptom even after cervical radical cervical spine surgery. Okay. So, in cervical, un, unlike lumbar spine surgery, in cervical spine surgery, the results will be very good. Patient will be very happy the next day. We can discuss them next day. If the yeah. patient is not happy, the patient is having persistent syndrome even after surgery. What I will do is I will give IV steroids. See if it have okay. IV irritated some nerve root, if there is nerve root edema, mm. just to decrease the edema, I will give IV steroids. The patient is okay. not improving. I will go to the MR, repeat MR scan immediately to see whether I have left the disc or not. Okay. okay. Usually, when we take an MRI after two to three weeks, there will be scar tissue and differentiating the scar tissue and the disc will be very, very difficult. If you are going to take an MRI, repeat MRI, take it immediately or take it after six weeks. So that it will be clear to see that. May I make clear thing, Edwin? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So in, in, in some cases, when the patient is coming up for follow-up, patient is having first neck pain, you are taking X-ray, there is a disc space and there is erosion of the end plates. Then you should suspect some infection. In that case also, you can go for MRI. So these are the two indications for post-operative MRI in cervical disc collapse. Okay. Uh, is there any, uh, what precaution you take when you take the posterior aspect of the disc in cervical spine? What precaution you say? One is you said you keep the neck in neutral position. Yes, So sir. that you will have an anterior and posterior uh, disc space will be of the same size. Yes, sir. But is it that uh, easy of taking the posterior uh, portion of the disc with your punch? Uh, 
uh, yes what uh, so, so i am distracting the space with pin distractor i am putting a pin in the c4 vertebral body i am putting a pin in the c5 vertebral body and it distracted distract so distracting gives a more space okay so usually we are operating anterior cervical spine surgery under microscope or under loop under uh, during anterior cervical discectomy with nac die is very very difficult so always use a microscope or a loop so you get better uh, magnification Vision. and uh, illumination light source is also very good so that usually i have a short hook like thing to so put a hook just manipulate if there is a disc collapse under pressure will just come out so that is way so posterior longitudinal ligament usually there will be some rent in the posterior longitudinal ligament when you reach the posterior longitudinal ligament with the nerve root probe gently palpate the posterior longitudinal ligament there will be some rent and through the rent you can go and search for the extruded disc collapse i think you need lot of experience to feel the posterior longitudinal ligament yes sir yes sir so for one of few cases assessing will help sir that's not a uh, technically demanding jobs okay okay thank you okay sir so any if there is no other questions there are some few questions asked in the chat part so so the pillow the so sir pillow can be kept for cervical disc collapse and not for cervical spondylosis is it okay yes in cervical disc collapse with radicular pain we should keep the neck in uh, flexion flexion so pillow can pillow is advisable in cervical spondylosis or either condition pillow is advisable but a small pillow in any case hyper extension is not advisable neutral position or flexion position is better than hyper extension okay one thing second thing what is the difference between myelopathy and radiculopathy so if there is a nerve root compression if there is a root compression the pain arising will be confined to the particular root if c7 nerve root is compressed the pain will travel along the c7 nerve root so that is called as radicular pain or radiculopathy if the disc is compressing the cord okay not the root it's a center part of the cord that's the uh, it's like a brain brain structure the continuous brain is the spinal cord if you compress the cord the spinal cord will go in for an edema that will cause myelopathic symptoms what is myelopathic symptoms it's a umn signs the reflexes will be exaggerated the uh, spasticity will be there the gait will be disturbed plantar will be extensor all these signs constitute myelopathy so compression of the cord leads to umn signs and symptoms which is called myelopathy compression of the root will lead to radicular pain that is called as radiculopathy next question is what is the difference between myelopathy and myelomalacia myelopathy is a clinical condition okay patients having myelopathic symptoms myelomalacia is an mri finding if there is any whitish thing significant changes in the spinal cord we call it as myelomalacia myelomalacia is an mri finding while myelopathy is a clinical condition i should be clear um, sir indication of epidural steroids pre op and post op disc bulge so literally i don't give epidural steroids in cervical disc collapse cervical disc collapse is extremely difficult so i don't practice in lumbar spine i try nerve root block if there is only particular nerve root is involved i give nerve root block if there is a lumbar canal stenosis then i will give epidural steroid with the help of the anesthetist post op post op condition if i are doing a lumbar spine disc surgery patients having persistent pain repeat mri taken there is no significant recurrent disc collapse in that case i can give post operative nerve root block or nerve root epidural steroid can be given so what is hoffman sign hoffman sign is a sign seen in cervical myelopathy the next topic that is on monday evening the topic is cervical myelopathy so we'll explain it on that day so i think i am clear is there any other doubts don't think even a small even silly questions you can ask i am not your teacher i am here to just to clarify your doubts and this kind of presentation is not only for your exams it is mainly for your practice purpose when you go out finishing ms ortho how to deal with these kind of patients just to help you out any simple questions you can ask 
<laughs> sir, during your epidural injections into the yes, nerve sir. root and all, have yes, you sir. got anything like a neurological paralysis, like a Saturday night palsy following injection, a chemical uh, neurotoxin to the nerve? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I have had. So whenever I give a nerve root block, I remember in the initial days, uh, usually nerve root block, the block, the, the drug should be not injected into the nerve root. It should be injected around the nerve root. So whenever you are in the introducing the needle, we will ask the patient whether the patient is having some paresthesia or not. Whenever the patient is having paresthesia or the severe radicular pain, withdraw. We should withdraw the needle and give. So I have, once I have given out of enthusiasm, I have given into the nerve root or just uh, supervision of the nerve root. Patient had foot drop following nerve root block, but it recovered after two to three weeks. Oh, it is not like Saturday, not like a radial, uh, radial nerve palsy for an injection. No, sir. No, sir. So it, it's an hydrogenic. It, my mistake, I injected into the nerve root, but it, it usually it, uh, recovers. 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 Okay. So if, if there is any question, you can ask the, this thing. So last lumbar disc collapse class, I didn't record. So I couldn't upload it to the YouTube. This class I've recorded and I will upload to the YouTube. And I will upload all my presentations to the WhatsApp group. So you can download the presentations and you can read it also for your reference. Okay, if at all you have some questions, you can check, uh, uh, Zoom group chat, you can send it or you can uh, personally message me. Thank you. Shall we end the meeting, sir? Thank you, sir. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you, sir. The so next meeting is on cervical myelopathy. That will be on Monday evening, 5 to 6 o'clock. Okay? okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, sir.